All right, folks, in just a few moments, we will hear from Jay Powell. And, uh, you know, more than likely, he's going to probably ask for more patience. Hey, just be calm. He's only buying $120 billion a month uh, in assets. So be cool. And, of course, he'll probably, of course, talk about the rise of the Delta variant. Uh, also, let's remember, and I talked about this already, the Fed's got a very close relationship with this White House. They'll take their cue from the CDC, which uh, did an about face on masks. You know, interestingly, though, in the U.K., uh, which saw this Delta variant spike before America, now they're starting to see daily case count decline. Their seven-day average yesterday edged down to 30, just a little bit more than 32,000. On July 21st, it was 47,000. So uh, is the Fed and the administration overreacting in general? I want to bring in uh, Bonson Group Managing Partner David Bonson. David, you know, um, let's let's talk about this for a moment because... We know Jay Powell doesn't want to make any adjustments, right? I mean, if he could really have it his way, he would leave rates in a combination where they are forever. Uh, And I think he's got some social economic goals. Some You can call them woke goals if you want. They have nothing to do with traditional um, uh, Fed policy. Having said that, having said that, uh, I think he gets some, I think he does buy some time with this uh, reaction to the Delta variant. Are you concerned? Well, it's not that I'm concerned. It's more just assessing the reality of the situation. I think you're right that he's not in any rush to be peeling away accommodation. I don't think it's true, Charles, he would keep it there forever. It's just I think he would keep rates very low and monetary policy bias towards the accommodation side for a very long time. But remember, the person who wrote the most interesting critique of QE3 back when Ben Bernanke did it, saying, how are we going to get off of this once we start it, was who? Jay Powell. And and I think that he understands the reality of getting a market dependent on all of these accommodative actions and then having to unwind it later. Delta gives them some cover to kind of throw that name out there. I'm curious to see his press conference in a few minutes, how much he leans on that. I don't think they believe it for a second. I don't think that there's any real concern about the Delta variant actually impacting their mandates, but I think it provides right. a talking point that it buys him a little more time. You know, I, I think that, Jay Powell, you described, uh, we saw up until the fourth quarter of 2018 after that fourth rate hike for the year, and something happened since then. It's almost like uh, when they uh, uh, someone goes to the Supreme Court and it's just not the person that you thought they were, and that frustrates a whole lot of presidents, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, well, you know, what, you know what, you know what, Charles, that... Go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead, pick up, pick it up. I think the Q4 2018 thing, it was very interesting because he had been raising rates and they had been tapering, but only about 10 billion a month early on. And what happened is they kept doing a little more and more of both. And eventually it took a while, but eventually credit markets revolted. The stock market dropped a lot. You had a trade war going on at the same time. And President Trump tweeting constantly how unhappy he was with Jay Powell. I think what happened in January of 19 was the real inner central banker came out of Powell, which just said, look, at the end of the day, we're all here to avoid deflation. We're all here to avoid business cycle disruption, to avoid Japan. That's really why they have us here. And now he's been much more accommodative. I'm not down on him personally. I think it happens to all central bankers. Right. No, you're absolutely right. Let's switch to politics for a moment, because um, apparently the GOP, uh, at least the senators on the Republican side, announced that there has been a big breakthrough now in infrastructure. We're going to have a price tag of about five hundred and fifty billion. We'll probably get a vote on that tonight. Uh, If that's the case uh, right now, we're starting to see material names do pretty well. Martin Marietta Materials making a big move. Vulcan Materials making a big move. What does it mean for the economy and the stock market? It doesn't mean anything because what they would do tonight is a vote to allow debate to go forward. And theoretically, it would mean they think they have 10 Republicans that won't filibuster it. But ultimately, the House Democrats are the key. And no one is talking about this. It's driving me crazy. It's true they have no margin for error with 10 Republican senators. Maybe they get that. Maybe they don't. It looks like they might. But the House Democrats, they only have a margin of three 
And Pelosi is saying she's not going to let it go forward until the Senate has voted on the three and a half trillion dollar side. So I still don't think anyone's figured out how they're going to needle all this together. It's a few months off. I don't think the market's able to discount this in at all right now, Charles. All right. Great point. Great point. And I don't think that Nancy Pelosi is going to budge either. Let's talk about uh, all this money printing. Uh, a lot has been made about the growth of the M2, the money supply. It has slowed, though, pretty dramatically over the last five, uh, five months in terms of year-over-year increases. Nevertheless, David, we're talking trillions of dollars. And I know we've kind of talked about this, but the money's still not circulating in society. There's no velocity. It has crashed over the last two or three decades. And I think this is one of the reasons just regular folks in America, just regular Americans are just so upset with the system. Like a system that prints this much money every single month, a system that's created trillions of dollars out of thin air, a system that bails out banks, it doesn't seem to get to everyone. I mean, I, this might be one of the reasons people are frustrated with capitalism and looking for something else. What do you think? No, I understand what you're saying. And I think, honestly, Charles, what we have is a problem with what the point of the Fed is supposed to be. People believe the Fed is supposed to be there to kind of heal problems in the business cycle. And the way they've chosen to do it is with all this QE, low interest rates. The Fed knows that it's intended to kind of rain on everybody, not just asset rich people. But if you don't have a lot of assets and you see other people's stocks and real estate going up, it builds resentment and envy in society. The fact of the matter is the velocity is very low because the government spends too much money and the government spends too much money because of transfer payments. That is the real secret that no one wants to talk about. So we are living outside Mm -hmm. of our means and we have crushed loan demand because the government has too much debt. That is absolutely phenomenal. I really have asked this question maybe Two dozen, three dozen times in the last couple of years, and that's been the best answer I've heard so far. David, thank you very thank much. You. I don't like the answer, you know, yeah. but it's real, and it's true, and we better do something about it. Talk to you again soon.